Andrew, since almost 40 years, you are doing research and practical words, work regarding corporate parenting. How do you observe the change of the topic and maybe also the acceptance of corporate parenting in the companies you are working with? Um, well, let me give you a bit of, uh, a bit of history. Because when um, I started working on this with Michael Gould, uh, the dominant thinking then was the Boston Consulting Group matrix yes. and the idea of balanced portfolios. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, about that time, the finance people were beginning to argue that balance could be better done by fund managers than by parent companies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were beginning to, the ideas were beginning to. Um, unravel in, in academia, but not so much in, in management minds. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, coming up with the idea that uh, you know, corporate centers should add value and making presentations um, in the end of the 80s um, and saying to um, corporate strategy people that, that instead of uh, being demanding of businesses, of the business divisions, to have mm -hmm. good business, business strategies, they should be demanding of themselves mm -hmm. to have good corporate strategies. Mm -hmm. And this was a, you know, a big shock. I particularly remember one uh, um, strategist responding, no, no, you, you've got it completely wrong, Andrew. You know? mm -hmm. the, our, our role is not to do something for the businesses. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's their role to do something for us. What is the reason why corporate managers have so many difficulties to illustrate uh, the value added they create? When executives think about these issues, they think of all of those um, artifacts, the mission statement, the vision statement, the corporate functions, the shared services, mm -hmm. the boards, the you know, board subcommittees and so on. And they, and, and they, instead of seeing straight to the gold, mm -hmm. so for me, you know, in that particular example, the, the big gold is the work they have been doing on, on portfolio change mm -hmm. and pushing down into the divisions to mm -hmm. affect the way they allocate cash and which businesses mm -hmm. they support. Um, and it's just that, it's just a way of thinking that is, doesn't seem to come naturally. Mm -hmm. Because of all of the administrative yep. uh, demands around them that they don't see so crisply where the gold is. Um, if you look on most of the multi-business firms at the moment, so what I can observe is that the power of the uh, functions, of the corporate functions, are increasing again. So are we in face of a new period of bureaucracy and ivory tower? <laughs> um, as you know, I'm quite suspicious of corporate functions. Yeah. Um, and I think they have a, a habit of empire building and becoming more ambitious than, than, than they should. Um, however, there is now an understanding of the dangers. Mm -hmm. We've been through enough cycles of corporate downsizing, corporate center, you know, layoffs, um, that people understand the risks. So we will probably go some of the same journey, but not as far. I suspect, mm -hmm. as in the past, mm -hmm. in terms of the bad, the bad side of corporate functions. Um, in the morning, we discussed also the question of synergies. And one of the arguments was that the easiest type of synergies to realize are the intangible ones. Do you have um, experiences as what kind of synergies are easier or not so easy to realize? I think um, a sort of simple answer to that is the easy synergies to realize are the very obvious ones. Financials, for example, are? Well, um, I'm not sure if I would call financials a synergy, um, because in a sense, if you have spare cash in one business, you can get it to another business without a common parent. So, so cash pooling but, is not a synergy? No, I don't see cash pooling as a synergy, mm -hmm. because, uh, because that happens in the capital markets anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you deposit your spare cash in the bank and they lend it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, no, the synergies, the obvious ones are things like consolidated sharing sales forces mm -hmm. or, you know, combined research and development or um, sharing um, offices in China. If you have two, three buildings, three businesses in China and they're all operating in Shanghai, why, why wouldn't they share an office? So I think 
usually it's the obvious ones that uh, make sense. The ones that are less obvious, you know, complicated best practice sharing, um, you know, trying to get cross-selling between businesses that may not have exactly the same customers, those usually never work. Realizing synergies means usually crossing silos, uh, yes. silos of the operating units. Uh, what are your observations regarding this crossing of silos? Because it's not so easy. It sounds easy, but it is not probably so easy. Well, if you look at the market economy, yeah. then businesses are doing business with other businesses all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what business is about, doing businesses with other businesses. Um, so why would that not be the same inside the company as outside the company? Mm -hmm. And it, to a large extent, where the, where the logic is strong, then people do business inside the company as easily as they do business with others outside the company. Um, it's, it's usually difficult um, because the synergy that they, the company is trying to create is, is, is either very small or, um, or very hard to get. And then, and then everyone talks about silos. Many thanks, Andrew, for interviewing.